Okay, so where we left off, we were looking at um, this uh, menu system and we had just uh, gone through our um, abstract class here, our UI system, and we've got public methods that uh, just take the regular string and string builder, but internally we convert those to a multi-string. Um, and then <coughs> we um, make those the abstract methods that we then go down and we implement in the actual implementations of the UI system. So we don't have two copies of every single method. Um, and it's a bit messy. We've got this issue here where we're like, uh, we'll probably need to fix this up. Um, we've got, uh, do, 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 do. where is it? Yeah, so we've got draw item that splits it out into a uh, string or a string builder, but then we go ahead and then we, in draw item, uh, we go and convert it uh, in label. So then we have to have uh, this, um... oh yes, yeah. so we have, to, we have to then call this version of label, which is the public version, which converts it back to multi-string. So that's a bit ugly. So we might try and fix that up uh, towards the end. <clears throat> um, so the first thing to do, let's go and look at our multi-string implementation because I've made a small change to this uh, after, why is it Apple always wants to do this when I'm broadcasting? It's like Thursday's their update day. Um, so if you go and open up multi-string. Yeah, I'm actually kind of a little confused because yeah. it's, it's um, saying that it could not be found, but I'm building fine. It's some kind of weird hiccup. I turned off my my other tool and it's still it says it's weird totally fine um, yeah oh it doesn't matter but maybe a yeah. full rebuild will fix that but anyway um so I made a minor change to this I took this uh, field and I've made it private and then I've gone final references on it so this text field and I've basically mm -hmm got rid of every single thing that's not a accessor or a constructor. I'll get rid of this to do because I've done it, but uh, I, I, I did that off stream. So I'll just have you do it. Um, so uh, the, the index are here, for example, and then that'll cover the struct itself, but also uh, anywhere else that it is being used, um, we need to fix up. So I'll, just give you a few seconds to basically make that change. Yeah, I'm a little confused. Okay. Oh, you want me to? Oh, oh yeah. Like... So they should all of them look like this. Oh, can I not see your? Um, are you off on the other screen with uh, final references? Oh, yeah. uh, no. no that's, Hold on. That's fine. Like, I mean. Yeah, yeah, that that will yeah, help, just... that'll help you out. So you do need to change this indexer, even though even though um, obviously it has access to the private field. I'm going to make use of the fact that these are um, methods in a few moments. So basically, the idea is we can uh, change the implementation of this section without going ahead and changing all our code. Yeah. Um, I don't know why yet, but you're going to tell me eventually. Yeah, so I, yeah, I just, just want to get that sort of started. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll sort of explain why. Um, so you recall that last time what we were looking at is um, we because we changed from uh, just passing string and string builder to different um, to um, what would you what do you describe it as? Uh, like different copies of the same method. Uh, and now we're doing this process where we're creating new multi-strings every time we call something. We were wondering how much does this cost in um, like CPU time? And so one of the things that we are going to do is make a comparison of different ways of implementing, um, implementing multi-string to see 
what the most efficient one is. So we're basically carrying on from last time. Oh, excuse me. The um, this guffaw here is making it. Oh, the a little a little harder to figure out what if, I have left to do. If you just close the file and then go, uh, what is it? Uh, build, rebuild. Is that solve it? Are you unloading the solution? Oh, are you building it from the? Uh, I see. Yeah. 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 It didn't. Um, it's a bit hard to see what's on your screen so obviously you're on the high res monitor so good luck everyone everyone on youtube oh i make it bigger oh uh, no I no the the, the, no. the uh the the text was fine uh where you had it but like the whole no. ui is just sort of you just just very oh yeah sort of guessing what it says oh. but that's fine uh that I, looks like it's still got squigglies yeah sure does um although it says build succeeded, but um, okay. Well, like I think I think I've done the changes. It's just not going to let me. Uh, that's fine. That could become annoying later, but for now we'll uh, we'll make it work. So you've made all those changes. It builds. Uh, thing is now. Oh, running. it could be because I'm in. I'm in. De I was in release. It goes away when ah. I'm in debug. That's weird. That is. Did strange. we do something? Did we have well, a, we, a weird if def in here somewhere? We are going to need it in. Um, in release build. So you'll recall what we were doing is we were coming here and we're like, all right, let's, let's see what this does. Uh, so I was putting a breakpoint here and I was running it and, um, uh, just, I'll get it off. Come on, come on. I will run it. I will get rid of this window and I'll stick a breakpoint here. And you recall what we're doing is we were hitting this disassembly window to try and look at it, or at least we were trying to and getting nothing. Uh, so that was the right. thing that I went off to go and fix. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, do a little bit of configuration of Visual Studio. Um, and I don't, uh, you might need to go back in after this and change it depending, because I, obviously I know you use Visual Studio for work, but I usually run with this setting on and it's fine. So uh, what I want you to do is go to tools uh, options and um, yeah, no one's going to be able to see that, but I, they'll just look at mine and hopefully it's very similar. So if you open the debug uh, section on the left hand panel uh, under debug general or just debug, mm -hmm. you get a bunch of options and the one that we're interested in, I like how they finally made that resizable in the new one. So the one we were getting the other day um, was so so sorry we uh, changed and uh, what you'll need to change is suppress a JIT optimization on module load. So that needs to be okay, off. Want... Okay, it is off. Yeah, at the moment. Okay, good. So what that does is when you um, when you hit debug in um, in a managed project, it builds uh, the IL the um, the executable file on the disk, it builds it either as release or debug. And that gives you your, uh, you know, pound defined debug, you know, if debug do this thing, um, it gives, I think it does include a little bit of extra debug information, um, potentially in the IL, but that's more or less it, what it does. It generates pretty much the same IL. It think it does a few optimizations, but not really many. Uh, the actual magic source is not this uh, release debug box up here. It's actually this checkbox. Um, and basically what happens if you uh, launch any managed thing in the debugger with this turned on, uh, whether you built it in release or debug, it will JIT it in debug mode. So the JIT itself has a release debug switch um, mm. and produces different uh, x86 or x64 instructions depending on what this uh, switch is set to um, so that is oh yeah so that means if you had it in release mode and you were debugging in release mode yeah. um, you would only you'd actually be debugging the debug jitted code yeah which which is sometimes fine but uh, when you're when, generally when you actually want to go and look at the disassembly like we're doing uh, like this. Mm -hmm. 
this has actually changed and there's a whole lot of, you know, there's a no op in there. Like, why, why is that there? No one wants a no op in their high performance release build uh, <laughs> most of the time. Um, so yeah, we turn that on to, um, to, 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 uh, yeah, to get the, uh, optimized assembly that we can then debug. The other way of doing this, I don't know why some tutorials and stuff online, uh, do it, but you, uh, launch it outside of the debugger. So you go debug, uh, start without debugging. And if there's no, so yeah, the JIT actually makes a decision based on whether a debugger is attached. It's actually not really that much to do with Visual Studio. So if you launch it without debugging and then attached process, you can attach to the optimized JIT as well. Um, but that's fine. That, this, uh, this saves a step. It seems like you wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that all the time. That would get annoying. Yeah, that would get very annoying. Uh, so yeah, the suppress thing turned off. I run with that all the time. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, the other one, and I have a suspicion that uh, it suppresses anyway if the thing was built in debug mode, I think, but you know, who knows. But the, uh, we did that last time, but the one we missed last time was enable just my code. So that needs to be off. Okay, it's off. Oh, it's off. All right, well, uh, yeah. So Visual Studio has very funny ideas about what just your code is. So um, <clears throat> it basically gets into situations where it's like, you don't need to see the disassembly for this because it's not your code. Um, so I think it's just for newbie programmers. It's like, oh, what's all this library stuff doing in my, you know, debug view? I don't understand a call stack. Um, and so, yeah, we turn that off because we are now professional and competent programmers that don't need that sort of crutch. So, uh, you're actually all set up the way it needs to be set up as by the looks of it. So you didn't actually change anything. No. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, we may have, have we ever done this before? I wonder if we've done this before. No, but I, I mean, I always turn off enable just my code um, uh, because that, yeah. I'm always, I'm always falling into the framework. Um, yeah. Actually, yeah. So that, yeah, that's me. But the other one, I think we checked off in the last one, the uh, suppress. Without yeah. the explanation, I think you just told me to check it. Uh, yep. to oh, yeah. It. Yeah. Um, and we're... obviously mine's, mine ended up checked because I did a reinstall of Windows recently. Um, so, um, 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 what was I about to say? It was, it was fascinating. It was great. Um, oh yeah. So, um, the, yeah, the, the sort of half-assed way that, uh, Visual Studio decides what just my code is, is basically is the, uh, I think it's, is the JIT optimized? It could be, if is the, uh, file optimized, but I think it's, is the JIT optimizing. And so obviously if you suppress, um, suppress, uh, JIT optimizations oh, right. and you're running a release build, it's like, ah, oh, this is a release, you know, jitted, uh, module. We won't, we, we assume that's not your code and won't debug it. Um, so that's sort of the, the nonsense that Microsoft's done. Anyway. Uh, all that introduction aside, let's actually go and look now at some disassembly. So hop on over to main menu, um, our main menu method, and uh, just run it. And while it's running, just uh, going to get rid of this window, just slap a breakpoint on uh, probably item. Um, Do, do, do. <laughs> oh, there we go. You, I'm, I'm astonished at how no. just no. Microsoft. When we see, well, well I'm building a, a, a monster computer, assuming I don't break it again. But if I haven't, my, I'm gonna, I really want to know what it's like on a 10 core <laughs> machine, 128 gigs of RAM. It, it's if yours beats it, I, I pretty much gonna quit and, and go home. Um, it's a text but, yeah. editor, Microsoft. It's <laughs> basically a text editor. How well, Visual Studio Code is pretty lean and mean, but I don't can't really do too Visual much. Visual Studio it. Code is written in JavaScript. <laughs> oh man! It's a, it's a, I got right. so mad the other day. I had to. Um, this is completely unrelated to anything anything on stream. But enjoy this little tangent, YouTube. Um, uh, I had to burn a like a disk image to it, a um, like a little flash drive, and so I'm like, all right, give give me a utility. And there's something called um, uh, I forget what it's called, Bohemian Flash or I don't know, 
Bowman. I don't know. Anyway, there's some little flash utility that's like write a you know a a dot img file. You know, just binary image to a oh what? electron. Yeah. So Chrome. Yeah. Chrome JS. No. Oh my! Oh my God! So yeah. All right. So it I was... didn't know that. I, I thought it was a native build. No, I mean it. It just as well cross platform. Yeah. So I had to. I had to burn a disk image to a flash drive, and I, I'm like, all right. Well, I'll just grab a utility that will do that. Fine. How how mu how many like bytes would you expect such a utility to be? Well, I think there's one built into Windows 7. Um, uh, you I'm... have to find it, but it's hidden. Okay. Um, I, I, but uh, like, I don't know. I, I bet I'd say like 32 kilobytes or something like that. Oh, yeah. I, as far as I can tell, the way they did it is they just called some command line thing in Windows um, to actually do the process of writing the drive. So it's not particularly special. But it was written in Electron, this thing that should have been 32 kilobytes, 300 megabytes and change. That's insane. That's because it has to bring in like eight million node modules that all have their own completely separate tree. Not not to um, mention like half or the vast majority of the Chrome browser. Yeah. Oh. What's that node what's that node module that is in everything? And it's like does one line? It's oh, like L. Oh the left cool. pad. That was that was the left <laughs> pad debacle. That was funny. Yeah, but I mean there, there's a lot of them that aren't quite oh that far off of that so like yeah. and then each one has an independent stack like they don't there's no like transitive i guess is the word like for the some like the references so each one is has its own tree even if they all have the same reference they all have a copy of it oh, yeah. in their folder it breaks the the windows um folder length limits you can't delete uh, node module sometimes <laughs> because it's too it's too big it's just too, too it's so nested Anyway, it's it's yeah, yeah. You never want to have to, you never want to have to check any of those in. So um, that's you, I never knew that. I didn't realize it was a Electron app, man. Oh, I mean, for something like Visual Studio Code, which is actually not too bad. Like, maybe I will give it to them. Like, I don't know. What are you going to do with a bunch of web developers? So we are going to do something that a web developer has never done, as far as I can tell. And that is, we're going to look at the disassembly. So uh, on your uh, thing, I think you need to go to debug Windows uh, disassembly. If you can find it. I found it. I don't know. Oh, there we hey, go. there we go. So, um, and what we should have, it should give you this um, title here. You can't, you can't, I can't seem to zoom mine. Ah. Oh. That's annoying. It's not zoomable. That's yeah. quite annoying. Um, good work, Microsoft. Let's let's see if that's a regression. No, it's not. I can't zoom it either. That's amazing. Okay. All right. right. Well, that's, so that's fine. Here. Uh, so uh, press the little yellow arrow in your toolbar. Uh, show next statement. I believe that will take you to. It will scroll the screen to where it needs to be. Sorry. Where is that? Where is that light? Um, or I don't uh, have it. Oh, you don't have that button. Great. Uh, it might be in debug. I've got no idea. <laughs> uh, just uh, what's uh, the hotkey? Does there a hotkey for it? If you hover over it on yours, I'm uh, sure it's probably alt, it's probably number pad star. Oh boy. Okay. I I have this feeling that it's somewhere hidden in here. Uh, um, it should be on the you know the play pause stop restart next statement step into step over like i don't use visual studio 2017 much i'm gonna i'm gonna be using it more shortly um certainly haven't used it much i haven't used it in anger since uh, i needed to reinstall windows um when my oh. oh there it is it's right there uh i'm gonna where uh if you remove your menu i'm gonna try and point to it uh, oh is it is it this one yeah okay it's just not yellow anymore okay, oh gotcha. yeah because color is so bad. bad uh i've got this <laughs> um uh I, I i tweeted this out the other day like something similar to this anyway and i'm like 
you know, when you're actually doing something like mission critical, this will let me find one that was good enough. Yeah. So when you're doing something like, let's say important, um, well, this will do. It's not very high quality, but it will do. You know, you. How, how would you expect like your control panel of what you want to do to look? You know, it might look something like this. Like, you know, all of these things are different shapes and different colors and so on. So you actually know which lever you're pushing. And so this moronic idea that everything needs to be flat and gray and the same color and the same like, I mean, it's image, but you know, it's texture, it's like, it's maddening. Like no one <laughs> to, to quote like Casey, for example, or, or John Blow, it's like, everyone is fired. Like you, you guys don't know what you're doing. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see what a like what a if you could like sort of like what's that um those really cool um very tactile UIs for like uh DSP like digital you know the um is it reason like, oh, yeah, they yeah, have yeah. the like everything you can like oh, they almost go down like like physical wires like being swooped in and now we have other ports and so on it's kind of like I wonder what the Visual Studio could get a makeover like that what it would look like like a cockpit of a That'd be interesting to see if someone could do a better job. Yeah. Like yeah. Just, yeah. Just, I just mean, to like... give anyone else like a feel for it, this is some software for music making. And I mean, like this, this is maybe going too far for most software. I quite, I quite actually like this. Um, uh, cause, cause you can see, you know, where all the buttons are. And it's also, it's a creative program. So it's like, gives you a bit of a feel. It's like, Hey, this instrument looks like it sounds to a certain extent. Um, so this is a good, good bit of music software. I quite like it. Um, have I got it installed? Yeah. So right there. Uh, I'm not sure that actually shows up on capture, but it's in my start menu. Um, I see. uh, yeah. Um, okay. Um, 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 um. now I'm trying to get back on track. <laughs> oh, well, I, I hit that button and I ended up in this. Okay. Uh, we've got the disassembly. Oh. All right. So. Uh, you'll notice that sort of if you scroll up, you can see the name of the method, uh, or sorry, the uh, file you're in, actually, it should be. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm struggling to read yours, but you should be able to scroll up a smidgen more. That's interesting. Um, can you just double check that suppress code optimization is uh, actually mm -hmm. set on your thing? Uh, you might need to stop and restart the program suppress uh, okay. jit optimization on load assembly load that does not oh. look optimized to me for some reason so uh, another another wonderful feature of vs 2017 probably well it's definitely not selected like okay it, there's no checkbox oh uh, my, no my bad so, uh yeah sorry i i completely forgot because you changed this before change uh your uh just uh stop the project and change the build mode to back to um release and try release. again. Release, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that answers your question about whether it suppresses it in any way on debug. Yeah, I thought the it The answer is yes. I thought so, and it does, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, like... All um, right. Okay, this is looking much better. So, uh, you can see what it does. It's like, okay, this code is the code for uh, UI label main menu, but it's actually the code for this line of code in this program. So this line which includes all of the like preamble of the function. Um, so we're pushing a couple of registers. Uh, we're subtracting from RSP. So I believe that is the register for the stack pointer uh, is RSP. I'm assuming yours is fairly similar to mine. Uh, like, I don't know what you've got there. I, I have RSP 60H, not 30, but yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, I'm at, yeah, okay. I got four pushes and a sub. You've got more pushes than me, but. Um, I don't know why. Um, actually, that's another different thing. compiler, probably. Are you in any CPU? You are in any CPU, and are you uh, are you set up? Is your project set to it? Probably is because it's the new thing. Um, if you go to your project, um, I can't remember where this option is. It doesn't exist in. Um, oh, you might need to stop execution to, to actually change these. Um, prefer 32 bit or yeah that was the one i was just like uh well i can just switch to though 
Yeah, so I don't, I don't even have a 64-bit. So we're going to work on... Uh, anyway, the point is we want a 64-bit thing. And I think I think our SP is a 64-bit register, I think. Um, well, I had double the... You had a 30 and I had a 60, so I'm assuming that, that I'm using double wide because I'm, I was using x64. Maybe you aren't? Mm, uh, no, I, I'm x64, but um, it's different versions of the JIT, I'd say. Anyway... Um, as long as you're in, um, as long as you're in platform, uh, any CPU or x86, we'll keep going. We'll probably focus on my screen because uh, I know what, um, like the differences are. Yeah, I, I think uh, sorry, I'm, I know what I'm also is. using. Yeah, it's a different JIT for sure. It's using like .NET four point seven or the Ryu, Ryu yeah. JIT. So also, I, I, this just caked on me. Okay. Um, Disassembly. Okay. There you um, go. All right. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect them to be identical. Um, so and they're close okay. enough. Okay. So let's start going through this. So the question we're trying to answer is, what overhead did we just add by um, adding this multi-string constructor? So let's. Uh, right. Let me just start this and get back to disassembly. Uh, let me just start this and get this thing off. Page. It's the cost of the branch, I guess, too, is what we're looking at. Well, let's let's have a look. And I mean, we probably should have looked at this before we actually changed any code, but we're here now, so we're just going to sort of make, make some educated guesses as well. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so, and yeah, we're going to look at uh, UI item start game because we just want to ignore UI label um, for now. What... Um, what I will do, however, I'll add, introduce this at this point. Um, uh, I was going to, I was going to save this, I guess. Anyway, I'll introduce it now, just so we've got a rough idea. So this is the Wikipedia article on uh, x86 calling conventions, and um, blah 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 blah. There's a whole bunch of calling conventions. The one we care about today is Microsoft X64 calling convention. So we're running an X64 build. So if we're running a um, x86 build, I think we want, uh, do, 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 do. I think it's Microsoft fast call is what, um, uh, uh bah, 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 bah. um, Microsoft fast call is what the x86 JIT uses. Uh, but for, um, for x64, we'll use, uh, this one. And so the important ones we need to know is like, all right, how does it pass arguments? So I assume you'll like have a rough idea about how a CPU works, like what registers are and so on. Uh, yeah, about that. Um, I mean, I took digital. I did, I took it in school like uh, eighteen years ago. Um. Mm. No. Okay. Well, no. that's that's fine. So, like, we are we are sort of programmers, and we're not like assembly programmers put it that way so we actually don't need to know we don't need to know any of this like we can we can muddle through without actually understanding in any kind of detail what the calling convention is um but you do start to pick up what the different things mean and like um what the different registers do and so on uh, the best way to analogize them is like uh, the registers are the things that can, like the CPU can do maths on and stuff. So uh, I think I think we've had this diagram before, where you've got uh, where did my pen go? Um, wait, all right, tablet. Okay, so where where uh, we've made a list of like you know, registers, and then you've got L one cache and then L two L three maybe and then uh ram network and it's like you know this is the uh increasing length of time to access any of these so i think we've had had this diagram before um seem familiar yeah i think we we covered this a little bit when we were doing the like sort of cache coherency and data oriented um design exactly uh yeah so um a, a register is basically the thing that's most in the CPU. Everything else, 
like uh, all of this stuff is also caching like, and yeah. storage and yeah like all of this is like this is RAM and like caches of RAM uh, and so what the CPU do is like, CPU will do is like alright I want to add say I have a uh, uh, I don't know I equals 2 uh, J equals 3 and um, <coughs> um, var um, this k equals i plus j. Let's say I've roughly got a program like this, and roughly speaking, what the CPU will do is like, all right, well, I'm going to uh, load uh, into like r1 from uh, the address of i. All right. Um, and then it's going to be like load into uh, R2, the, uh, is it the address of I? Or from the address of I, yeah. I'm not that much of an assembly programmer either. From the address of J, um, so like ignore, like from squiggle and from squiggle, just pretend those are I and J. Um, yeah. And so this brackets around here is like load from an address effectively. Right. I think. Anyway, it's a pointer, right? It's, and here's a place, and here's a location in memory that um, we're sitting on. Equals uh, two, yeah. So just like Rough. just fudging yep. it. So it's not even called load. Load is like what I'm calling it now, just to make it easy. And then it's like add, and this is you know I, and this is J, and then what would be? It would be something like R one, R two. And then what you'll find is R1 is equal to uh, 5, and R1 is now the value of K. So this is something called register assignment. So what the compiler will do is like, all right, well, I have a limited number of registers. So I have a limited number of instructions, and most of them only take um, you know, two parameters, certainly in uh, x86. So you know, I can't do like there is no instruction add you know r3 r1 r2 so i have to do i have to do it with just two registers so right yeah i know so, yeah i just said what you just said yeah yep. yes i have to do it too so the compiler swap. the jit in this case will assign registers to variables as need be and then say say we were done with that then it would probably do something like um uh, move. Oh, well, I'll keep using my load. Uh, let's call it save, even though it's effectively the same thing. And into you know the address of k. Um, uh, one. So this is sort of what assembly looks like. And so uh, these registers are the things that the uh, CPU can actually do stuff with. And um, I see. We have to if and we... because they're sorry yeah I just trying to... because they're because you have so few of them that's why the uh, L one two and three caches eight quite um, are important right because you have to store those off somewhere so that you can do more work on the registers is that the point of it um, yeah basically basically like yeah registers are very fast and very expensive um, in terms of silicon. So um, there's only a few of them. Uh, also, there's like things about instruction encoding would become uh, complicated and so on if you could just, like you can't do, for example, add another, yeah, another instruction that doesn't really exist is add, um, you know, X and Y. I'm pretty sure you can't do this. Um, so you can't, take a memory location, um, add it to another memory location, and then store it in this memory location. You can't do that. Um, and one of the reasons you can't do that is like you have to think about how a CPU would do that. Uh, like it's got, you know, on the, if you've seen like a die shot or something, or a, um, let me see if I can find one real quick. Uh, CPU, um, bo -bo 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 -bo. I've got one right here you could use. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tragic. Um, 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm looking, not even a die shot, like a uh, block diagram. Let's see if I can find a good one on uh, this image search real quick. Uh, so here's like roughly speaking, um, so you know you got a floating point unit and you've got address, integer register file, control, where? Address generator. I don't know, somewhere or other. Um, suffice to say that uh, there's actually a separate unit. This is probably close enough. This is really simplified, but there's a unit for um, grabbing stuff out of memory and storing stuff into memory, and it's separate from the ALU. Um, oh, okay. So you can't, like, you, you have to load stuff into a register before you can manipulate it in any real way. So it's like load instructions send out requests to this memory unit and we'll actually like stall the CPU. So something like this, the only way a CPU could actually implement, we just broke my color wheel. Um, the only way a CPU could actually implement something like this is um, to break it down into this anyway. Um, right, that would just be like a shorthand or an alias when in reality you would just be doing like you'd have to yeah, pull them out of memory, get it to the control, control loads it into the register, does the add, puts it back in memory kind of thing. Exactly. Um, I actually have been, uh, have you, uh, da, 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 um, have you seen uh, this game? No. This is really cool. This is this is uh, by the same guys who did World of Goo. Um, cool. And you know, you if if you if you're feeling like like it, you could try it. But you can see it's sort of it's very assembler like uh, like it's like jump copy from copy to, and so it copies it takes things out of this input. This guy can like hold on to a little cube. Here we go. This one. Oh, here's one. Uh, guy holding oh. onto a cube. So this is effectively a one register machine. Your only register is this guy's hands. Here's one of him actually holding onto it. Um, and so, uh, and then you've got the floor, which is more like RAM. It's like you can um, save stuff into it and load stuff out of it with, uh, uh, was it the copy to slot zero, copy to slot one sort of thing. Anyway. A fun little game. It's is, sort this of... a, is this a game or is this sort of like trying to sneakily teach you? Assembly? Oh, I think a, a lot of great games actually, you know, sneakily try to teach you things. But yeah, this one is very blatantly sort of is, is you are writing assembly. Uh, there's no question right. about it. Um, good game. I, I enjoyed cool. it. it was, I, obviously, being a skilled programmer, it was over very quickly, but it was it was enjoyable for a couple of hours. Um, you say that I, it sounds, sounds like it sounds like I should play it and find out how long it takes me. Yeah, well, I, I would recommend fun. it because it, it is actually decent practice. At like, ah, oh. it's it's a bit different because you, uh, because it's only one register. Um, you mm -hmm. can actually like do like add from memory and so on, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so this is more or less what the CPU is doing. Anyway, uh, so then we move on to this calling convention, which is what we brought up before. It's like, right, the Microsoft calling convention, it uses registers RCX, RDX, R8, and R9 for the first four integer pointer arguments. So <laughs> in other calling conventions, what they would do is they'd actually write out arguments to the stack and then call something. And then that method would just immediately load them off the stack. It's like, well, why don't we just pass a couple in registers? Because for you know very small functions that take a very small number of parameters, um, we may as well uh, just use mm. registers and save the write and then the readout uh, from memory. So we can actually look at this here and it's like, uh, yeah, and the other important thing is in the calling convention, it's the caller's responsibility. No, no, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, the shadow space on the stack, that is actually not really that relevant. Uh, where is it? Uh, where? Somewhere or other it says whose responsibility it is to... Um... Oh, 
Oh, okay. The registers uh, are considered volatile. So, oh yeah, call a saved. So uh, these registers, if um, you call a function, you have to save these yourself. If uh, you use these registers, the function that you call, the call e, if it wants to use them, it will save and restore them onto the stack for mm -hmm. you. So you've actually got a mix of both depending okay. on what you need. So right, right away I see that like a lot of the calls that we're doing are basically moving RCX to RSI, like moving the volatile one to the non-volatile one. Um, register. Well, let's let's start now. Now we have a rough idea of what's going on. Let's start taking a look. So uh, we're pushing and uh, we'll bring this back over. I'll uh, cover your screen with it. Uh, so because we want this list here and we also want to know what uh, RCX, RDX, R9 are. Um, uh, okay, so we're pushing R14 and um, we're pushing RDI, we're pushing RSI, uh, RDP, and RBX. So we want to That's use. That's for them. label though. I thought. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I... so this is the preamble to the function. So I've actually. I was going to okay. skip over the preamble, but I'm actually going to go through it just because it's a good introduction to what's going on. So we're pushing cool. all these onto the stack. Um, so this is this uh, stack pointer here. Um, and the stack grows backwards, which is why this is a subtraction. So uh, RSP is the stack pointer. Um, so register it, stack pointer. Yep, RSP. So, yep. It points to where the top of the stack is, or I guess the bottom because it's growing downwards. Um, so we're saving these ones because they are coolly saved. So we want to use them, but we have no idea if our caller might have been using them. So we have to save them and you'll find at the end, we scroll down all the way down to the end, we actually pop them off at the end before we return. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and then let's see, we, we subtract from the stack point of XOR EAX EAX. Now we actually ran into this, I think we caused this bug ourselves because um, yeah, the other time. Yeah, that we, reverses. Or, yeah, I remember that one. I did that one. I screwed that up on my side. I ended up, I accidentally hashed, I XORed, or yeah, um, what do you call it? You un uh, undid the hash twice. by yeah. doing it twice. So what do you suppose XORing a value with itself does? Um, probably clears it. Yep. Clears the register. So it set, this is setting the register to zero. And the reason that they do it this way like this is actually the CPU will detect this scenario and actually optimize it further internally, I believe. Like it will skip doing math and just be like, oh, this is, EAX is now zero. But the reason they encode it this way is that this is the smallest encoding of it. I, okay. I can't remember how many bytes this is. Like, I think it may be one, maybe. Oh, we can actually tell, a, it, yeah, no, sorry, two. So A, B, C. So you can see, uh, this is this is the offset from the top of the function, how much these took. So this took two bytes, this took two bytes. Uh, this took one byte. Uh, sorry, this took one byte, because you can see it's three there. Uh, and mm -hmm. so did all of these. Um, I wish uh, my offset was more readable. Yours, yours is nice and readable, but mine is like this hex. It's actually 16 characters and yours is eight. Yeah. I think that has something to do with the 60H and the 30H. For some reason, my disassembly is being shown in uh, uh, like double, like 16 um, by bits. Well, or it's, probably, it's probably showing the actual address in memory, uh, which, okay. is, which is handy. For some reason, uh, this one, the disassembly just shows the offset from the top of the function. And you can see I can't, can actually, I see I can't actually scroll up, mm. whereas you can see the full disassembly of memory. So are you about to say? Uh, what's your view? Like the little drop down that says viewing options. Yeah. Uh, it's like right here under. Um, all right. I just want to see if mine are this. It's, oh. uh, it's the same. In Never fact, mind. in fact, I, I can do this. So I can actually see what this encoding was. So these are the bytes, literally the bytes that encode oh. the machine code for the CPU. So you can see. Well, that, at least it'll help you count them easier. Yeah. So, so this is two. Because so they can Yeah. Yeah. Like, it doesn't really matter how long the encoding is like it's handy to know about for like this case why that is the encoding for please zero this register uh, and that's just because it's small so you can see something like move which is equivalent to load or save is that's like three bytes here uh, four bytes here um, and crap ton of bytes here 
because uh, it's storing an address. So uh, the Intel encoding is a variable length encoding, uh, which is, you know, fine. Uh, anyway, I'm going to get rid of that just so it's a bit more readable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, close that. All right. So uh, we're doing something to the stack pointer. We're, we're growing the stack. That's right. We're, so we want another 30 bytes of space on the stack um, that we've reserved. So if we call anyone, uh, they're going to get a different stack pointer location. Um, so that's uh, if we if if you recall. Um, <clears throat> looking at disassembly, uh, uh, in fact, yeah, uh, decompiled um, stuff uh, like this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the IL for it, you'll sometimes see like a little stack block and it'll just be like, we've reserved space for these temporary variables. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an example of that handy, but um, let's see if I can find one. Uh, just real quick, let's see if uh, any of the screenshots show something my internet has just decided to be real super slow um, all right here we go um, uh, da, 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 perfect this first example so here's some disassembly um, and it's like all right locals in it um, and here's one two three four locals that have been uh, reserved max stack five so this is sort of the same thing the IL is reserving space on the stack for these local um, local variables. And okay. I suspect that was what we're doing here. Um, and then we actually get into, I think we do a little bit more setup here. I'm just going to sort of skip over this. And then finally we call this method here, uh, which will be the call into that. So is that making sense so far? Any questions? Uh no, I mean I have like lots of questions, but uh, you know, like, but I, I'm following. It makes yep. sense. The okay. um, yeah, yeah, just uh, that move before the call, register AX is being moved to the address that we eventually call. Um, yep. But it's also being moved to a, the RSI register. Okay. Um, is that basically the current, like the top of the stack RSI? Uh, no, like, RSO, I believe, is just a plain old register. They've got some wacky names. Um, mm. Sort of in the super old, like, what, what is the, the x86, you know, derives all the way from the Pentium, what, like 8080? So not even an, <laughs> like an 86, but an 8080. Um, you know, like the Z80. So these are like legacy. Like yeah. the Z80, which had registers like, uh, it had register like A b c and d or something or i think it may have even just had a and b where it's only registers so hence a and b and i think i'm, try, I'm trying to i can't remember the exact details but usually it's like a is the accumulator and that register was the one wh which could actually do more stuff than the other registers because you know silicon was very expensive back then so you right. have this that like, one super register and a couple of others that you know a, B, C, and maybe D that could actually do stuff. And then the, uh, they got the X on the end because they became extended. Um, so EAX uh, is the, so it was something like A register was like the eight bit one. And then I think, e, uh, I think AX was the 16 bit register. And then they expanded out to EAX is the um, 32 bit register. And then so, RAX is a 64-bit register. And they all point to the same register. But it's like, how, how wide would you like to think of this register today? Like, would you like to think of it as being 32 bits? Or would you like to think of it as being 64 bits? Uh, okay. So it's always, yeah. So it's sort of like a, a tiny bit like those um, intrinsics where it's like, I actually have space for this whole amount. But we're going to pretend it's this much kind of thing. So does EAX just mean like, the A register and there's two different ways of saying extended, like extended once with X and then extended again with E. Yeah, and then extended again with R. So it's eight, sixteen, right. thirty-two, sixty-four bits. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, so so it's all it all points to the one register, so it just points to the lower thirty-two bits of it. Um, and then yeah, so that they sort of at one point in the development of these things, there were specific uses for specific registers. And like some obscure instructions, for example, might only work on like the RDI and the RSI register or the 
D and the S register or whatever um, it was, or the DI and the ISI. Um, and so that's what they got called. So I suspect that DI and SI are just generic registers for the majority of the time. Uh, RSP obviously is the stack pointer though. So that one is special because it uh, push and pop instructions use it. Mm -hmm. But like whatever RDI and RSI like are used by, I don't know. And it probably doesn't matter, I suspect for most uses. And then finally you've okay. got this, you've got uh, R8 through 15. So they added just like, well, we're doing a 64 bit processor. We can add another, uh, eight registers four. oh right yeah four here and four here <clears throat> but um yeah it's like well we've got space so i think there were roughly yeah roughly eight registers um before and they're, they're like well we'll go to a total of 16 registers and we'll give them like sensible names rather than like sort of these weird mnemonics but the reason i guess the reason they can call them r8 r is, is these ones don't have short versions um Right, because they were never existed in the 32-bit processor. Right, they haven't been extended yet. R8X will come. Oh, 128 bits. Yeah, CPUs. once we get up to 128 bits, yep. Um, <laughs> oh, he heaven help us. Okay, so let's start looking at what. Yeah. Let's start looking at what this does. So this is the reason I s wanted to skip over UI label, is it's got all this craft above it. UI item, we can actually look and be like, all right, one, two, three, four, five instructions. Um, is what's going on and let's look at what it does so uh, first of all we let's look at the registers we're using we're using DX CX and AX um, so we only care about three registers here so into DX which uh, if you look here in do, 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 RCX RDX so RCX and RDX are going to be the things that get passed to this call so we already know that DX and CX are the uh, arguments. Right. So DX is the second argument, which is here. The first argument, RCX, is going to be the this pointer. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, yeah, non-static methods always have this hidden this pointer argument. Right. And that's how they work. Um, so we can already, like, we can obviously tell RDX we're loading in this... Uh, this is a pointer to something and we're loading in whatever that gets pointed to. In fact, I can open up the debug, uh, windows, registers. So I can actually see what's going on. It's not particularly helpful, but we can see it nonetheless. So uh, this is gonna load um, into RDX, whatever is pointed to by this pointer. Now this pointer was uh, created at um, the uh, JIT time, I guess, like this is a, a fixed value. So it's that in hexadecimal, which is the H. And so if I hit uh, step over, you'll see that RDX will change. So it's that at the moment, which is probably some nonsense. And I'll step over it and you can see it changed. Um, I, and the register of the instruction pointer changed. So this is this, is this yellow arrow is that. So you know how... Oh. Sorry? No, so I said just saying cool, like, yeah. okay. So you know how yours has got these complicated addresses? This one's very similar, you know, they start at the 7FE. Uh, I think, I can't read yours, but it looks like yours is about yeah. that same place. Yeah, 7 FFF, <laughs> yeah, 08A3, yeah. yep. Um, and you can see this one changed. So this is now pointing to this. And so we can assume that the uh, this will be a pointer into a string table, or a, like, a, a table of strings. Intern, intern strings already? Um, it might be the interning table. Maybe. I, I'm not sure it's the exact layout, but this will be a pointer into the garbage collected heap where the actual string is stored. So um, mm -hmm. hopefully that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so this is now, RDX now contains a pointer to the string object. Um, so this pointer also contained the pointer to the string object. So we've just copied. No, sorry, a pointer to a pointer to the string object. This pointer to a pointer of like that starts to get confusing and annoying, and so I'm sort of going to gloss over it slightly. But anyway, so we now have a pointer to this in RDX. Then RCX, 
that's just coming from RSI. Uh, and if we look up uh, before what RSI was, we can see we pushed the old version of RSI and then uh, RSI here da, 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 came from RDX. Um, and so we've copied RDX into RSI. So RDX would have been, again, the second argument to this function. So this is UI. Right. It's yeah. It's the reference to the U. Yeah, to the UI instance. So or you'll the pointer to it. Exactly. So you'll notice sometimes when I'm programming like really uh, stuff that I want to be quite fast, I will actually try and make sure that the arguments don't change positions because you can see because they've changed positions from uh, the second parameter to the first parameter. Um, like we've had to go, we've had to uh, do, 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 RSI, RDX to RSI, and then RSI to RCX. So having to do a couple of moves to get them into the right place. So if I wanted to really clamp down on the amount of code being generated by the JIT, like I will keep my arguments in the same order. Like the same order in the method signature, or do you, well, mean you the, have to like pin them? The same, the, I, mean, I mean, in the same order in the method signature. Um, uh, sort of. So if 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 um, <coughs> sorry. Um, <coughs> so if um, if I wanted this to be high performance, I would actually make this a static me method, and I would switch like uh, UI would be the second argument, and start game would be the first argument, so that you know I'm right. over overriding um, uh, CX. But IDX stays the same all the way through, and it can just leave it in that register. Uh, so you'll notice that some of the um, uh, the serializer in River City, all the code generation for that, all of the generated code has the arguments very specifically in the same order, so that it's never it like loads it into that register at the sort of start of serialization, and it just leaves it there the whole time. Yeah, and that's um, one one trick that gets used to do. For performance stuff so we've um, <clears throat> very simply in just two instructions we've loaded the UI pointer and the string pointer um, right and this is just copied it between registers now all we have to do is figure out what uh, to call and so what we're doing is we are calling whatever's pointed to by RX plus 28 so uh, let me just get up the whiteboard here uh, do, 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 do. whiteboard please okay uh, make a new sheet of paper for this okay um, <coughs> actually uh, I'll just scroll down this one um, okay so <coughs> um, 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 um. right so we're calling a method so call into uh, whatever's pointed to by RAX plus 28. So RAX, and this is like 28 has got, oh, actually, I'll write this differently so it makes a bit more sense. So in here will be a method. Um, now, if we go and look back at our. Uh, Disassembly. It's like, all right. Um, what what was RX equal to? Well, it was RX plus forty eight. So we'll expand this out again, and it looks a bit like this. So it's like uh, we're loading whatever was in RAX. That's plus forty of the offset, and that's a pointer, and so we. move into there and then we do it again um, uh, rx plus 48 and then into uh, rx we load whatever um, rsi was uh, so sorry whatever whatever rsi was pointing to uh, hang on um, It's pointing to RCX, I guess. That's which like, is... Okay, yep, 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 yep. So, uh, RSI. Um, 
and then this plus zero. So this thing, you know, gets loaded into Rx. So we've we've sort of mapped out our uh, move move call. So this is come back. Um, so move move call. So now we can start thinking about what's actually going on here. So we've got um, RSI we know because we just copied it into RCX and we know we copied it from RDX. We know that this is UI. Um, <coughs> and so this is this is our UI um, thing. So in fact, this is will be like either one of UI draw or UI update object. Um, so this is the actual object here with like all of the data, but we know that at offset zero of the object is a pointer into the runtime. So this is going to be the uh, R T T I information is this one. So runtime type identification. So this is all your reflection stuff, you know, your type name. So when you do it like a um, uh, is or an as or something, it'll look at this field and it will look at the RTTI uh, if it needs to, to compare. So if it's like, uh, if you do a type of, um, let's say UI equals of type of, I don't know, this say uh, this it'll just convert this and it might do some more fancy stuff but it could in theory just convert this into let's compare the first two values in the object to see if the types are identical does that make sense um yeah other than, I, I don't think you can do type of this but i, I get the point yeah um i yeah, type of you'd have to actually call get type. I think yeah, that should actually be yeah. Uh, you know, UI dot get type, and you uh, this dot get type. Great handwriting, everything. Um, anyway, no, no, I, yeah, no, I, yeah, but it you, makes, it makes sense. I didn't think it would like, but the RTTI isn't going to store like every instance back to that type. It's just going to be like a map is it a, is it like a reverse index reverse hash or is it more like just it's in there one time and you're looking at some kind of like metadata token to do a single compare of the address in that table so i i believe that this one the jit will optimize that specific piece of code to just look at the address uh, right. but that's actually okay, a that thing. Sense. otherwise it will actually generate you know the type Object, yeah, well, the get type call I'm pretty sure has a cost, like because it has to do a lookup as opposed to type of, which can be optimized. But t I think get type is a runtime type because it could be anything, um, like as like an inheritor or whatever. So I, I think that one is less good. Yeah. yeah, it has to convert it into an address, I guess, in this case. Yeah, so it's um, whatever it does, it's sort of not all that important. It's just, all you need to know is this is the back end information that the uh. You know, type mm -hmm. the type system essentially yeah users and then in that sort of back end information what the oh, my mouse was moving um oh i haven't hit that bug where i can't draw oh my god it crashed <laughs> amazing okay. uh, so I, while it's still on my screen uh the type information points to a method table so this is going to be a list of methods and we want the 28th method in that list so for example, okay. when we call label, we want the 20th method in that, or sorry, the method at offset 20. And when we call item, we want the method at offset 28. And this is just the, 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 the JIT method table, basically, that has all the places where you want to jump to, like of every method that's in the module. Exactly, and, and one of the reasons you do this is because um, now now we can be like, well, what what is what's in that method table? like? Um, uh, other methods anywhere do, 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 do. like fix, fix ideas getting inlined um, exit uh, uh, is exit a oh, this is getting optimized beyond all reason uh, oh hmm. huh 
I'd have to think about that. The optimizer is doing something and I can't read that quickly enough. Anyway, suffice to say that, you know, we already know because we have the code that this could be pointing to, this could be, it could be pointing to this, but it's obviously not pointing to this because it's looking up a method in a table. So we already know that it's inlined um, this call here, item, it's calling into this virtual one because it's looking up the method in the table. So this call here could actually be either one of the item implementation of UI draw huh. or UI update. So like literally, so it's it, we're actually finding out that it's free. So in conclusion, it is actually free. So we then can go uh, step through the assembly. We'll step again. Uh, we're just updating the registers, and this is the call. So we're now going to call into it, and we step. It's going to give us the disassembly, and we'll go back here, and it's telling us it's the multi-string here. So it inlined everything, including um, it inlined this call to there, and it inlined the construction of the multi-string. So well, that's kind of awesome. So it understands that this is a pointer, and this is a pointer, and this is a pointer, and this is a pointer. It's all pointers. It's all pointing to the same thing. And so if we pass this through, we don't actually have to do anything. We just pass the pointer, and it's just a different type. But it's in the same memory location, so it will just leave it in the same memory location. And so it gets rid of all of the calling stuff that we did to generate this multi-string. That's awesome. I didn't expect that at all. Okay, well, that's that's what I wanted to go through. I'm like, you know, how much does this cost? What what's the cost involved? And the cost at the call site is nothing. Um, <clears throat> now, but we kind of locked out, though. I mean, like, we didn't control. It's not like we did one of those method IMPL like hints to do the inlining. Like, we just got that because the compiler figured it out for us. Um, well, the compiler is pretty good at that. Um, like, certainly yeah. because. Um, because C-sharp code is absolutely littered with like get and set methods like that look like this. It's like, well, get me that. And it's just returns that. It's very good at inlining very short methods. And so... Right, especially, yeah, it makes... Yeah, so it almost can conventionally say, oh, you're just pointing to this, so I'll just remove you from the... Like the... I guess like it's... Re what is that? It's like un uh, unrolling the the stack, I guess, of calls to just find the address that you were trying to get to, um, in a way? In a way, like, I mean, it's calling it, calling it unrolling is... Misnomer. Like, it's a that misnomer. It's like, it's like, I mean, yeah. you may as well just call it inlining because that's what it's doing. It's taking uh, taking all... What it, what it does effectively is it takes all of the code here, which is just this one method call, and all of the code here, which is like a method call as well, and it just drops it in line into this method. So it inlines it into this method, and then it realizes, well, now I've inlined it, and I'm starting to generate the code. This data just stays in this one place. It doesn't actually do anything useful. So I'm just going to generate you know, no instructions for it. I'm just going to copy it out of uh, this register here and just leave it there. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to copy it out of uh, this register here and just leave it there for the for the string. Um, right. So when we say, I mean, when you're saying inlining, like we're we're literally copying instructions that uh, out of a method and eliminating that call. So I believe it does the inlining at the IL level. It might do some of it at the JIT level. Anyway, I'm that that's getting too deep into the implementation of the JIT, so I'm not quite familiar with where it happens in the process. Okay, right, but but conceptually, that's what inlining is. It's removing code from uh from out from inside a call and moving it in line with the call that in, it's called exactly. from. Exactly. So and it kills an instruction, which is always a good thing. Well, it removes the call like instruction a call. automatically. Yeah. So this one here is like right. instead of calling item, I'm just copying that and pasting it here obviously i can't because it's private but the jit doesn't care um right and then i'm like well yeah it's just a pointer it doesn't care if it's private that's just, here, so, that's just that's just yeah so yeah. It's, it's taking this and it's inlining it. it's like well you know item text equals text it's like well we'll just 
take text, which is, you know, and then we'll pass this through. And it's like, item. It's, and so it's the right. same thing, only it's now calling. Oh, that's so cool. This method here. Like, I had my head, I had just had, I had my mind blown like three times so far. Excellent. I was, if I was more, uh, if I was less tired, then I'd be more excited about it. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's like three things that, that's uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Well, for yeah, I mean, crap. So like that's um, yeah, no, that's that's super cool. I don't know what else to say. Excellent. Well, like it, 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 the RTTI is what gives us this free thing because it knows, like it knows that like you know in, in that spot in the code whether like it, you know you can't hide from it. It knows whether it's a string or a string builder. So it has no problem finding the address of the exact method that we're calling. It doesn't need to uh doesn't need to do any kind of like runtime check on it so it makes exactly. sense like now that i'm seeing it all light, laid out like that so um yeah um that is this 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 is the uh effectively the same diagram so there's actually a um so if you've got an object reference like like our pointer to a string uh sorry like our pointer to a ui system that will point to the data of the thing. So this is the instance of the reference type. So this is this is either, um, you know, with all its fields and stuff, either UI draw or UI um, UI uh, update. And so always at address zero or offset zero of the object reference. Ignore like the pointers here are actually kind of useless, but. At uh, address zero, which is the thing pointed to, is always a pointer to the RTTI structure, which is this stuff internals to the thing. Above it is a sync block, which is used for like, uh, like if I were to write lock UI, for mm. example, that uses the sync block, for example. So does uh, UI.get hash code. If you call the default implementation of get hash code, it, I think it abuses the sync block to. Um, generate a identifier for the UI. Uh, so each of these has effectively a unique identifier. This is why um, you can vaguely use this to identify objects. Yeah, maybe like in the same method, but it's not good for what we were doing. Oh, yeah. Well, makes, in, yeah, in the same pretty... process, but yes. Right, oh, okay. Um, and that uses the sync block. So if you subtract, so this, oh, this uh, pointer points to address 20 20 in hex. If you subtract uh, four or eight bytes, depending if you're in x86 or x64, you get to the sync block. So this is actually a negative offset. And then you've got this address here that points over to the method uh, table. So this is exactly what I draw. It just flipped around. Uh, right. And this is a whole lot of stuff. It's like you know, how do I generate you know the the you know UI dot get type. Um, you know, it knows that and so on. Um, it knows like where all the virtual method table is and stuff, and then it's um, uh, mm. inherited virtual method addresses. So this is like a list of. This is actually wrong. It's actually not uh, laid out like this. Um, as you saw, the method table is actually a pointer to a, another structure that is the method table. This is actually right. this is actually wrong. This should be the R. Uh, this should say runtime type identification. And there should be a pointer over to the next one, which is the uh, method table. So hopefully that all made mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a lot. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. So I've I've got I've got a bit more, but I think we're over time now. So I'll save that for next time. We'll do a bit of revision. But that's that just gives you a taste of like what all this assembly looks like and um, and so on. Um, yeah, that's and and you know we can we can like start stepping into methods and uh, you know oh, step into a method at some point step into and you know we can start stepping through the assembly and you know uh, here's a call here we actually we're probably not actually going to reach that uh, can I step into it uh, no uh, I don't think so or is that why is that taking me oh no I know what that was so. One one little fun fun fact just to close off with, and that is, if you run this, uh, and you've got the window up, and I, so I haven't actually run this before, and I look at the disassembly, and I start stepping into 
things. Um, you'll see that this uh, call here, mm -hmm. uh, this is the address of a stub function that the JIT has generated. So it hasn't actually jitted whatever this is. So this actually calls into the JIT to generate this me method. It will then go, go and patch this to be the actual correct address because you'll notice all of our uh, actual call addresses start with 7FE, whatever. Right. If those were already hydrated, this would be an AOT system, right? As opposed to a JIT. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, if, if, if this were not a JIT, we wouldn't have these. But um, so this is the address of this call stub, uh, which will hop in. I, th I think these are all different. Maybe they're, yeah, they're all different. So it jumps into a stub that jumps into the JIT and generates the method that it needs to call at that point. Um, so that's if, if you're wondering what these calls are. Um, so I think I'll end it there and that's a fun thing to play with and you know go play uh, human resource machine if you're interested in that sort of thing um, I d I've almost finished um, the sequel which is uh, I'll just bring up some images of this one so the sequel is like 7 billion humans and it's sort of a similar thing but it's about multi-threaded programming so instead of one dude you've actually got like a whole lot of dudes and they all run the same program so you actually have to um oh you have to make it thread safe pretty much it's yeah it's, it's sort of a nifty thing so it's less assembly like you've got if statements and for each and so on um so it's simplified in that oh. sense but uh but i think it's probably breaking the breaking um developers concept of like mutating state and being more functional and yeah, exactly. Like thread affinity and yeah, so it, thread local storage. Yeah, it's it's um exactly. It's, it's more of a, like a threading thing. So that's also quite good if you want to, I, I guess, have some fun with like thread programming. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish there was one for trig or calc or physics. Or <laughs> maybe they'll I come up with a couple. <laughs> I was like. I was like that one. That one is that, that is one one for uh, phys physics is probably this game. <laughs> Gorilla face. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I love that. Game. It's a great game. All right, um, I'm gonna close off the stream. Thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, we'll come back next time and finish off our discussion of uh, disassembly.